about the history of plant classification today. So just back to a little bit of talking and slides. Um, so, uh, I think of it as kind of a succulent. Yeah, I bought it for myself as a present when I got my PhD. <laughs> so, yeah, right? Everybody <laughs> deserves to buy themselves presents. So, I approve. Okay. So on our first day, we talked a little bit about the idea of classification. So what we're thinking about when we're talking about classification is just the orderly arrangement into some kind of hierarchical system. So we've seen some phylogenies, so those maps of evolution. We've looked at some dichotomous keys, those yes-no questions leading us to descriptions in our field guides. And there's a long history, as you might expect, of plants being classified. Okay. We all interact with plants. Minimum, we've got to eat them, but they're also medicinal plants. They're around us. So as long as human history has existed, I expect they have been classifying plants in some way. Our earliest records of classifying plants are from around 2000 BC. We have a book from a botanist in India called Arshara called the Ayurveda, I don't know if I'm pronouncing these words right, um, but it contains a bunch of info on medicinal uses of plants. There are also texts from ancient, the ancient Chinese, Egyptians, Aztecs, there's all sorts of documentation, the relationship between humans trying to figure out about the natural world around them, trying to describe it, trying to classify it so that they can make basically guidebooks for the rest of us. Okay. So there are a number of different ways people have 
thought about how should we classify plants and organisms more generally. So we're going to go through a couple of them. This is roughly historical. So one of the first ways that people started classifying plants was by form. So we call this a form system. What a form system might do, is look at this grouping of objects and say, okay, how can we group them? So you might say one group is something like things with one leg, giving you a cane as one. Maybe you're using number of legs overall. So we have four legs here for this chair and so on and so forth. So you're making groupings using convenient characteristics, but it's artificial. It doesn't necessarily say anything about the relationship between those items or those species. <laughs> that said, it's not useless, right? We have useful concepts that we draw from form systems. Um, so note about the slides as we're going forward. I'm not big into memorizing names and dates. Right? Would have been a history major or something else if I were. Um, so what I want you to focus on here is the ideas, right? Our goal for this class is for you to be able to talk semi-knowledgeably about plants and about evolution systematics with people. So we want to have an idea about the main ideas behind this stuff and what we use from it now rather than just memorizing something like this. Okay. So that said, uh, one of the earliest texts that described form systems, something called Historia Plantarum, uh, by a Greek student of Aristotle and Plato named Theophrastus. And one of the interesting things about this text is that he divided plants into different forms of plants. And by forms, we mean like basically kind of how tall they are, how many branches they are. So he divided plants into herbs, shrubs, and trees which are groupings that you will often see in field guides, right? So we were looking at a guide for coniferous trees when we were going through that lab in the first week, rather than herbs and shrubs. So we still use these kind of groupings today because they're helpful, right? They're helpful for the way we interact with the world around us. We also distinguish between annuals, biennials, and perennials. So that sort of life cycle of the plant. And again, these are things you'll see labeled right in a greenhouse when you're trying to buy plants for your yard or house plants. Right? These are these are helpful things to list today, even though we don't use them so much for systematics anymore. Uh, people working on form systems also describe medicinal uses and plant anatomy. Romans were super into this, um, so we have an early medical text called Materia Medicia that details about 600 Mediterranean plants or more that Europeans used for 1,500 years. It must have been a really good book. <laughs> don't know why nobody decided to edit it. Uh, we don't really use it today anymore. We have new systems of classification. It's very helpful. Okay. Another concept we draw from form systems that we'll talk about a lot more in the future when we talk about angiosperms is the division between monocots and dicots. Uh, so one of the people who classified plants this way is uh, a scientist called John Ray. After graduating from Cambridge, he traveled around Europe collecting plants. When he came back, he decided to be a blacksmith instead of a biologist, but you know, <laughs> uh, his works that he created during this time were very helpful for us. So he collected a lot of plants and described them. Um, so one of these things that we still use as a division in plants and actually does map pretty well onto some phylogeny is the division between dicots and monocots. Okay, so looking at these, di means two, mono means one. So you might immediately be able to guess, right, one of, one of these main divisions is. So reminder, angiosperms are our flowering plants. They have flowers and then seeds. Okay. So monocots and dicots are divided based on how many cotyledons they have. What a cotyledon is, is basically an embryonic seed. So you can see a picture, some seeds. So here we have a corn kernel on the left. And here we have a bean 
on the right. Corn is a monocot, a bean is a dicot. So we can see that curled inside these seeds, we have some sort of embryonic structures of the plant. So what we see when we look at a seed is the seed coat, but inside we have an area that provides nutrients for the growing plant called the endosperm. We also have early structures folded up inside that are growing. So one of the very important parts is the cotyledon. So that's the early leaf that's folded up inside. So we can see it in green here. Uh, it's number four in the corn. And the bean is number six here. These store food reserves. In some plants, they begin photosynthesis when they pop up out of the soil. Actually, not all of them. Sometimes it's just a storage vessel. Um, but monocots have one, dicots have two. And very interestingly, and one of the reasons we still talk about this division commonly today, is that monocots and dicots actually have differences in a lot of traits. So we define it based on how many cotyledons they have, so those embryonic leaves but they also have different venation patterns. So when we looked at parallel veins versus uh, piculate veins or palmate veins, um, that is a division often between monocots and dicots. So monocots, often we think of monocots as kind of grasses and things like grasses, so they'll have parallel veins. Their vasculature, their vascular bundles, so that xylem and phloem is arranged differently. Dicots include things like a, a lot of flowering trees, right? So that's why we kind of see those rings forming in trees. Root systems differ. Dicots tend to have cap roots. Monocots tend to have fibrous spreading root systems. And when we get to flowers, we'll see they even differ in the number of petals. So there are a lot of differences between these two groups because it's actually an evolutionary difference at its base. Our second type of system is a sexual system. Uh, so when we say it's a sexual system, we mean that it began to classify plants based on their reproductive structures, so like their flowers, flowers, seeds. Uh, Arles Linnaeus um, was one of the first people to use this system, or at least use it and write it down. In the press, he used to be called a plant pornographer back in the day. Apparently, they were very scandalized by looking at reproductive structures of plants um, to each their own. Uh, he's important to the history of classification. If people have heard of anyone who classified plants, it's probably this guy, because he's the one who came up with these Latin binomials. So the genus species names are based on the system that he created. You see his name at the top is Carolus Linnaeus. That's how he enrolled in university. He gave himself a Latin name himself. This is funny to me. <laughs> yeah. So he had books where he classified plants and animals by their sexual characteristics and classified an awful lot of plants. So a thousand plus genera, 7,000 plus species. The cool thing is that his herbarium, and an herbarium is a collection of pressed plants that you can refer back to later, it still exists. So the Linnaean Society in London has all those pressed plants, um, contains more than 14,000 specimens, but also contains more than 4,000 type specimens. We'll hear this word again as we move forward into uh, modern classification systems, or if you think about any uh, if you in the future think about paleontology in any way, you'll see this term type specimen. What that is, is that the first example of a species that you collect, whether it's a fossil or you go to some new continent and collect a new plant that you've never seen before, the first example of a species to be described gets a name. It gets associated with a Latin name. And then every time you find that species again, you have to compare it back to the original. And that's how we say, yes, this is the same species. Yes, they should have the same name. So occasionally, this will cause a hubbub when multiple people were using the same scientific name for things we then discover to be two different species. Um, so the type specimen, regardless of uh, 
whether it turns out to be a good type specimen is the one that holds the name and, and it's our permanent records. Another cool thing about the uh, Linnaean Society of London and this next collection is that it was poking around and they've digitized it. So we can work with this a bit later, but we have that herbarium, those press plants available to us and we can search them to look at them. We'll probably work with this a bit in the future as we move forward. From there, we move to the early natural systems. By the late 1700s, this was getting unwieldy. The sexual system was no longer really adequate for describing all the plants that they were trying to name. Um, so they kind of broadened the number of things that they were looking at. So they started to classify things based on overall plant resemblance. Uh, it's the technical term for which would be gross morphology. Gross, when we use it in a scientific term, doesn't mean like icky, disgusting. It means big, basically big, general, large. So another class I teach might be called gross anatomy, right? The cadaver lab is not gross because it's disgusting. <laughs> it's, it's gross because it's large and visible. Okay. Uh, this was largely a form of something else we might call phonetic classification based on physical similarity. So it's kind of similar to those early form systems, but expanded and later. So I thought this was describing natural affinity among groups of plants, so maybe a little bit of a flavor of ecology in there as well. Then Charles Darwin came out with the origin of species and this changed how people looked at species, at organisms, because this brought us the concept of evolution, right? Publicized it, made it popular. So our final historical system that we might think about is the post-Darwinian natural system. So this is really just kind of adding in evolution and the idea of common descent onto those previous methods of classification. So in the post-Darwinian natural systems, uh, they were trying to classify plants based on evidence of evolution, based on evidence of common lineage. Okay, so they were looking for ancestral relationships, and they were trying to create what we called on uh, the first day phylogenies, right? Those trees that involved evolutionary relationships to classify things. Uh, an interesting figure here, mainly interesting to me because of this picture. Uh, Charles Bessie uh, was an American botanist who was influential, especially in North America, uh, as uh, they were developing these post Darwinian systems of classification. Uh, his system had a strong influence on the modern taxonomy of plants, and he has this lovely cactus, uh, the Oputnia Bessie, Bessie's cactus that shows his idea of the evolutionary relationships in angiosperms, the flowering plants. So here we can see where he thought the root was, and he created old branches as he thought the evolutionary trees divided. So here we see the monocots, our most uh, traditional dicots are on the right, and then we have some additional dicots here in the center. We'll talk about different groups in the future. But you can see how well, the idea is there, right, these branches. But this looks a little different than the phylogenetic trees we saw examples of on the first day, right? Well, sillier a little bit, but, but it was influencing the direction we were going. So what I want to do for the rest of class, though, is to recognize that not the only way to think about plants is to talk about plants. Um, so we're going to listen to a talk by Dr. Robin Wolf Murr. She is an indigenous scientist. She wrote a book that we have, she wrote several books, but one of them we have over in the other classroom called Braiding Sweetgrass. You may have heard of it or read it because it's been on a lot of bestseller lists. Um, but I think she's a really interesting speaker and a really, uh, I don't know, resonates with me. So we're going to listen to her talk and over the next week, you're going to do a short reflection of assignments that you'll submit on the spray tape. So I'm just going to hand you those reflection questions for now if you want to think about them as we're watching this talk. Part of the reason I'm assigning this as well is as we were doing our last lab, 
I realize I have a slightly different way of thinking about plants than maybe some of you do. I realize I classify plants partially on what I might describe as vibes. I don't know, I have some, some sense of plant vibes, but I was unaware that that was a skill or a different way of looking at plants. So I'm curious about what your relationship with plants has been. Um, hearing Dr. Schimmer talk about the relationship with plants, I'll be kind of under. I'm going to up with a bunch of extras there at the end. So you don't have to write anything on here now. You're going to just type stuff up on Brightspace, but maybe helpful to not have to go back to this later if you want to jot down a couple notes. When you're submitting this, it's not going to be super formal. A couple sentences is fine. If you treat these questions as if I texted them to you and you're texting back, that's that's about the level I'm looking for. Right, it's not like a paper. <laughs> So uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who is a moss biologist, ecologist, and an acclaimed writer. Uh, she is a SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. She's also founding director at the College of the Center for Native American or for Native Peoples and the Environment, the mission of which is to create programs which draw on the wisdom of both indigenous and scientific knowledge uh, for uh, the shared goal of sustainability. Professor Kimmerer's research includes reproductive ecology, dispersal, and community ecology of mosses in Northeastern North America, and the role more recently, the role of traditional ecological knowledge in ecological restoration. In collaboration with tribal partners, she and her students uh, have an active research program in the ecology and restoration of plants of cultural significance to Native people. Professor Kimmerer is a member of the Potawatomi Nation, and she is the co-founder and past president of the Traditional Ecological Knowledge Section of the Ecological Society of America. Professor Kimmerer is the author of numerous scientific papers on ecology of moss, restoration ecology, and on contributions to traditional ecology knowledge uh, to, our, uh, to understanding our natural world. She is also the, the, uh, the author of a number of acclaimed books, including Gathering Moss, uh, which is an intimate account of the biology and lives of mosses. Uh, Gathering Moss was awarded the prestigious John Burroughs Medal for Nature Writing uh, in 2005. Her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teaching of Plants, was also uh, awarded the Sigurd Olson Nature Writing Award in 2013. Her, uh, writing, Robin Kimmerer uses her elegant and visionary voice to tell intimate stories about small, forgotten or overlooked communities, from the uh, tiny assemblages of mosses in the forest to the original indigenous nations of this continent. Uh, join me in welcoming Robin Wall Kimmerer. Thank you, Dr. Schimmer. We unfortunately are not invited to the reception. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here, uh, for taking the time to, to come together and, and to share ideas. Thanks to the Frankie Center for this wonderful invitation. And you know, having invited a plant ecologist to come and speak with you, um, you might be thinking we're going to see some data today. Um, yeah, nope. I love a good p value as much as the next scientist. Um, but the kind of values we're going to be talking about today lie at the intersection of nature and culture. We're really going to be looking at human values. And instead of uh, uh, graphs and tables, we're really going to use what my friend John Talmadge has called the most sophisticated uh, communication technology ever devised. And my students always say, you mean Google? And now I say, I mean the story. So we're going to talk stories today. But first, I want to greet you in my language. I don't speak much of our language. Why our teachers and our elders tell us that because our language is an endangered species, we really need to um, breathe life into it whenever we can and use it. So in the Potawatomi language, I greet you. I say, Bojo, Bojo. 
شب دست که گیف کوکوی مدرش نکاس بود و وان میکوی دا مگزه دو دم نیم وان مکو دا دم نیم وان میکن دا مان پی یا یان I told you that I'm a Potawatomi woman, that my name is Shabadaske Gishkokwe, the light shining through the sky woman. I'm a member of the Bear Clan and also of the Eagles. And I'm very grateful to be here with you. And gratitude is our first responsibility. And so let's just take a moment to begin with gratitude, to remember that this morning, when we woke up, we put our feet on Mother Earth. And everything that we needed was provided for us. And we had water to drink. We had our beautiful clouds moving across the sky with that beautiful air. We had food. We had the companionship of geese in the sky and the companionship of the bare branched maples and the companionship of each other. So many gifts that come to us. And our first responsibility then is, is gratitude. And I also want to give a special gratitude to the original peoples of this place, the Pequot peoples, on whose ancestral territory uh, we are sitting at this very moment. To introduce today's talk about the teachings of plants, um, I want to introduce you to one of my great teachers, this plant called Mingosh, uh, sweetgrass. Um, Sweetgrass, uh, in our language, that word lingosh actually means something about the beautiful fragrance of that plant has a lovely sort of vanilla odor to it. It means the open um, wet meadows where it grows. And it also means a call to ceremony and a call to prayer because this is a sacred plant for us. This is a medicine plant. It simultaneously heals the earth because it's an early successional rhizomatous perennial that binds up disturbed soil, but it is also as a healer of a spirit as well. So this is, is an important medicine plant. And while we call it Wingosh, you may know it as sweetgrass, Linnaeus called it Hyrochloe odorata. And in botanical Latin, that means the sacred, fragrant, holy grass. So I think Linnaeus knew this plant uh, very well. We'll get back to Linnaeus in, in just a little bit. When you see a uh, wing gosh, like the you almost always see sweet grass braided. Anybody know what that is? It is certainly stronger. The reason that we braid sweet grass is that sweet grass is part of our creation story. And that sweet grass is understood as one of the first plants that grows on earth. And we think of it as the hair of Mother Earth. And so now you know why we braid. Think about the last time you braided someone's hair or someone braided your hair. And the general smiles that I just saw emerge here um, tell us why we braid sweetgrass. Because it's a form of relationship, isn't it? Braiding. Um, we braid Mother Earth's hair in the form of sweetgrass as a sign of our tender care for her. And um, so this important plant comes to us as a braid. And we'll have more to say about that in a little bit. This notion of braiding sweetgrass, those three strands, I also use in the, as a dominant metaphor in the book, Braiding Sweetgrass, thinking about each one of those strands, and there's three strands, one as scientific knowledge, one of them as indigenous traditional knowledge, and the third, the knowledge of the plants themselves. Because both traditional knowledge and scientific knowledge are constructed knowledge by humans. But we also have to acknowledge the inherent wisdom and knowledge that are in the plants. And so that too is represented in this brain, all these ways of knowing. But I have to tell you that the relationship for me as a native scientist of those three ways of knowing has not always been an easy one, as you might imagine. And let me just tell you a little story about that. Here you see, of course, a beautiful goldenrod and aster, that purple and yellow, they're so stunning together in the fall. And I always loved this combination of plants. And I was, I was born a botanist. I can't remember a time when I wasn't attracted to and engaged with plants. And this particular pair has always been my favorite. So when it came time to go to college, I knew I had to study botany. And when I went to school, my very first day, 
My freshman advisor said to me, if some is well, why would you, do you want to be a botanist? And I said, I want to know why Golden Rod and New England asters look beautiful together. That's just what he did. <laughs> Um, I wanted to know about relationship. I wanted to know about harmony and beauty because these plants do look so stunning together and they often grow intermixed. So they're, they're, they're aesthetically so gorgeous and I thought there was an ecological meaning to, to that as well. But he said, <clears throat> my dear, that is not science. And so as a, as a person very much interested in, in traditional indigenous ways of knowing, I said, well, I also want to know why plants make medicine and why you can bend willows for baskets but not other plants. Um, and he said, also not science. He said, if you want to know those things, you shouldn't be in science. And so this was my first encounter with the scientific world view coming from an indigenous worldview of growing up on the land in my community. And that's why I look so happy <laughs> in, my, in my freshman photo. I was stunned, quite honestly, because I thought a question of beauty was a darn good question. But I was told it wasn't, that it didn't matter, and that if I was interested in beauty, I should have gone to art school. And I had no vocabulary for resistance. I didn't know what to do about this. I thought that I must have made a mistake about what was important to me and interesting about plants. And so he signed me up for my general botany classes and I, I went right in to take them. But now thinking back on that day, and my gleeful work on my first day, which was study botany, which was my dream come true, was that it was really a very powerful echo of my grandfather's first day at school. And my grandfather's first day of school was when he was nine years old and he was taken from our reservation in Oklahoma and put on a train and sent to the Carlisle Indian School. His first day of school kind of went fine, where we were told, what you think doesn't matter. Your way of knowing, there's no room for that here. But they didn't cut my hair, and I could still speak my own language, kind of. Because my language of nature was nature as subject. I understood the plants and the animals, the insects, the birds around me as beings, as persons. And that the land, which I was being told was the ecosystem, I understood as a community, a community of, of sovereign beings. And with that worldview, I have to tell you that studying botany was really challenging because the organisms that I had thought of as persons, in a sense, were now um, reduced to objects. And in fact, this was the model that we were given of, of, of ecology. Um, this is what an ecosystem was. The ecosystem as machine, not as um, community. I thought I had wandered into an engineering class by mistake. Um, nature as object. Because again, within the indigenous way of thinking, I was raised to understand that every person has these four ways depicted in our medicine wheel of understanding the world, mind, body, emotion, and spirit. And we're always told that unless you understand what all of these four gifts of human beings, you don't really understand it. But in we're going to the scientific worldview, I went to a worldview that just privileges the intellect and that which can be observed and measured by science, but that um, very deliberately sets aside spirit and emotion are those other gifts that we have. I had walked out of a, um, of a worldview in which man is understood as a web of relationship that brings all those things together. What we didn't really understand, I think, is at that point was to the, you mentioned pluralism, that you have a speaker coming to talk about pluralism in, in science, that just as we know that the driver of biological evolution is genetic diversity, that if we think about cultural evolution toward sustainability, toward right relationship with the earth, that that requires intellectual energy. It requires all kinds of ways of understanding our relationships. And that is really the work that we're doing at the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, is to bring together the, the wisdom and practices of traditional
traditional indigenous environmental philosophy paired with the tools of Western science to solve our, our most pressing environmental problems. And we like to think of it not so much as a monoculture. I don't know about you, but um, what I experienced as a brand new college student was an intellectual monoculture. That the way to understand nature was through the scientific lens only. But what we're thinking about doing and we're trying to practice in our center is to create a knowledge garden inspired by the Three Sisters polyculture, um, grown by native people all over the continent where you know that corn, beans, and squash are not grown in isolation, but they're grown together, right? And it reduces competition between them. They partner, they support one another. But the beans don't become the squash, right? Um, there's, there's not a privileging one over the other of blending. We have sovereign ways of knowing that support each other. And so the garden, that the knowledge garden that we are trying to create is this where we have a symbiosis between traditional ecological knowledge and Western science. And then ourselves as teachers, as educators, as thinkers to help create that symbiosis. This is what we are trying to do. So if we go back here to this notion of nature as object versus nature as subject, this question of the nature of nature, if you will, is certainly not a new one. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is the notion of object versus subject in plants and thinking about plants as persons and what we gain um, in that dialogue. Two books that I want to recommend to you, if this is of any interest to you at all, these wonderful books, The Philosopher's Plant, and Plants as Persons are um, really great treatises that have informed a lot of my thinking. And we will begin as we do in the Western canon um, with classics, right? The Greek philosophers who thought about the nature of other beings and whether or not plants were living beings was an active area of, of, of discussion. And um, many of the early philosophers, Plato and Theophrastus, who was the father of, of botany, um, concluded that while plants were very, very different from animals, they were definitely living things. Um, they were not as close to rocks as many of their um, contemporaries had thought. Um, and they actually said that plants have souls, they have virtuous souls, which are associated with their beauty, with their generosity their provisioning for everybody else. But Aristotle um, suggested otherwise. I love this quote. Some have said that plants have intelligence and can acquire knowledge. Let us dismiss these theories as trivial and abide by sound reasoning. Um, he thought that if plants had any um, uh, notion of, of soul or beingness, it was what he called a vegetal soul. And the vegetal soul simply meant that they had and work going on to grow, to grow and to reproduce, but that's it. And of course, you think in the Stella Natura, um, the great chain of being, where do plants occur? Way down at the bottom of this hierarchical rank system, right? In which the angels are on the top, um, uh, humans just below them, and plants just above uh, the rocks. And this notion of plants as primitive, um, hierarchical ranking of beings certainly underpins much of our botanical sciences today, as we'll see in just a second. So this Western worldview uh, placement of plants as low man on the totem pole, right? That they are at the bottom of biological hierarchies, primitive, lacking in most capacities. Well, I would say that that idea of low man on the totem pole needs some um, uh, critique in a number of regards, particularly what does it mean to be low man on the totem pole? A common misperception by Westerners looking at this marvelous art of the uh, Pacific Northwest Coast is that the one who is on top of the, of the um, totem pole is the most powerful, the most honored, that's pretty consistent with our biological hierarchy. So we are at the really top. 
But that's not true. In this art form, the most influential, the one on which everyone relies, is at the bottom of the totem pole. Perhaps right where plants are, the most in, uh, influential and important, taking their place right there. Like the plants at the base of the food chain, they hold everything else up. And in contrast to this hierarchical way of thinking about plants, plants at the bottom and humans at the top, in the indigenous worldview, from the dream time of Aboriginal Australians to my own Potawatomi people, the plants are viewed as persons, as full-fledged persons, with their own gifts, their own intelligences, their own intentions, their own ways of being in the world. And when I say that plants are understood as persons, I don't mean this kind of person, a fictional person like the uh, familiar ants of Fanghorn Forest. And I certainly don't mean these persons. Um, isn't it interesting? All you have to do is put a face on things and suddenly they become uh, beings. Anthropomorphism at its very best, a smile on a carrot. Um, the kind of personhood that I mean as a reflection of indigenous ways of knowing is not anthropomorphic. It is not um, um, assigning human characters to plants at all. Um, in fact, what it does is to, to, to celebrate the fact that plants are very different, very different ways of being than humankind, but they too are persons. They, they too are autonomous beings with their own experiences, their own perceptions, and indeed their own agency in the world. A person can have intelligence, sensation, self-recognition. A person bears their own capacities. And most importantly to our discussion today, a person is capable of entering into relationship, particularly into um, uh, reciprocal relationships. Not only in Potawatomi culture and those of many of my relatives, relative nations, are plants viewed as persons, but they are viewed as teachers, as among our highest, most revered of teachers. And why should this be? In the Western world, these organisms, which are viewed as practically nothing, close to the rocks, are revered as teachers um, among indigenous peoples. Part of it is the understanding that they have been part, they have been here on Earth far longer than any other beings. But there's really the recognition that what other beings on Earth take light and air and water and make food and give it away. Great healthcare plants, food plants. They make medicine too, that's their healthcare plan. They make medicine and give them away for free. Plants are understood as, as generous agents generative agents as well, creative beings that teach us how to be in the world, teach us how to, what it is to be uh, a right being in the world, because you're constantly engaged in give and, and, and take. And so you see that if you come with that worldview into the, into the botany lab where you're simply dissecting plants and thinking of them as objects, that's kind of an uphill slog. So I'm so excited by the new fields of plant neurobiology um, that are doing some really amazing work to demonstrate the fact that plants do have their own agency, right? That plants can make choices, that plants can hear and respond to sounds, that plants have memory, that plants can plan ahead. All of these attributes of personhood, of beingness, um, that are we're not finding in the plant biology laboratories are in a sense an echo of what our uh, traditional teachers always told us. And there's certainly no question that plants provide generously, as their original instructions were to do, for all of us, for human beings, given all the medicines that they make us, um, the other resources that they make us. I want to pause for a moment on that term of resources, because whether it be food or timber or ecosystem services, all of these things are that things that my natural resource conservation biology colleagues refer to as either ecosystem services or natural resources. And that language has certain consequences, doesn't it? When 
when we think about the beingness of, of plants, natural resources, that which is not valuable and so it's transmuted into something that humans need. The language in our Potawatomi language, of which I'm just a beginning student, the name that we would give to natural resources is gifts. That all of these are gifts. And gifts, therefore, open us to a relationship with them. When somebody gives us a gift, what do we do with that gift? What do we do in response to that gift? We say thank you. We enter into gratitude. And as I said, gratitude is our first responsibility because gratitude acknowledges the gifts of the world, things that we have never, that we have not bought and paid for, things that we don't necessarily deserve, but they are given to us. And when somebody gives you a gift, yes, you say thank you. And then what? What's the next step? You give back, right? Um, gratitude and gifts open the door to reciprocity. And this is another reason that the plants are understood in our culture, because they teach us from the seed to the fruit and back to the seed. They teach us about reciprocity and, their, and what is our, our, our role. So if we think about plants as our teachers, the question then becomes how can we be better students. What is it that they are teaching us, and how can we be better students? And I want to tell you another story about that related to notions of sustainability. My friend Carol Crow, who is an Algonquin biologist, um, went to her band council, which is the tribal government, to ask for grants in the context of sustainability. And so she went before her elders and was asking, and they said, Well, what's sustainability? And she kind of laughed, thinking, well, that's the way our people have been living so well in this place for, for millennia. Um, but she used these definitions that are familiar to all of you, right? Lots and lots of different definitions of these slippery words, sustainability. But in these excerpts that I've highlighted here, one of the things that is certainly present in all of these, um, ensure the attainment and continued satisfaction of human needs, continue to provide. Um, do not diminish, diminish the potential to meet my needs. But she told her elders all that. And they were very quiet. And she thought they were going to turn her down. And they said, no, we want you to go. It's very important that you go to that meeting. But we want you to go and tell them something. Carry a message. And tell them that their idea of sustainability is really a way to just keep on taking. Just keep on taking. She said, they said to her, you go and tell them that it's not our right to keep taking. When our feet hit the ground in the morning, we should be thinking what it is that we have to give. Just as the plants are constantly giving to us in reciprocity, what is it that we have to give back in return for this shower? of gifts that comes to us every day. And sustainability as a powerful cultural goal is completely reframed by this notion of, of not about taking, but about giving. And this is one of the instances in which the lens of indigenous knowledge and philosophy can reshape the way that we think and contribute to that cultural evolution we spoke of at the outset. Because traditional ecological knowledge is full of stories and practices and philosophies about ways in which human people have a beneficial relationship with the earth. When I teach general ecology, I ask my students, um, how well versed are you in negative relationships between people and the earth? And every hand goes up. They know all about that. But then when I ask them the, the opposite, what about positive relationships? between people and the earth. There are very few hands. And so how is it that we're trying to train the next generation of environmental stewards when we cannot even imagine what positive, mutualistic, reciprocal relationships might look like with, with the earth? And this lens, this, this framework from the indigenous worldview is a, is a powerful tool for moving the earth. In fact, what uh, Carol's elders, the pre-elders were essentially saying 
is that we should be thinking not what more can we take from the earth, but what does the earth ask of us? What is our role as human people in, in response to these gifts? How do we reciprocate the many gifts of plants from every breath of oxygen that we take to food, to medicine, to beauty, to companionship, to them being our teachers? In one of the most powerful ways, in a world that is full of monarch butterflies and goldenrod and asters, redwoods and salamanders and blue jays, a world which is full of all of these other beings, shouldn't we at least be paying attention? No, we're not. Our whole society suffers greatly from what has been called plant blindness, of not really even being aware of the gifts of, of plants. And one of the ways that we talk about paying attention is by knowing names. And yeah, I'm a botanist, so of course you think, well, yeah, she's going to go on about plant taxonomy now. Well, yeah, a little. <laughs> um, but more than that, when you come to know the name of your neighbor, doesn't that bring you into relationship? It opens the potential for reciprocity. When you don't even bother to learn the name of somebody around you, that's a sign of disrespect. And so by not knowing the name of the one who makes the aspirin for you every day, or the one who makes the syrup that you pour on your pancakes on Sunday morning, you don't even know their names. It's an act of disrespect. And so there's a notion of learning names by paying attention. This little plant grows in everybody's backyard here, I'm sure, or along your sidewalk. Does anybody know this plant? Yes. Wonderful. Say that again. I'm in a botanically literate audience. Heal all. That would be a good name to know, wouldn't it? <laughs> if you just needed to start with one plant name, heal all would probably be a, a good one. Remarkable plant. I wish I had time to talk all about its chemistry, but it does. It's, it really heals a lot. The plants? Uh, this is a camas meadow, Panacea chumash. A plant, again, um, all of these plants are here because they are stories of reciprocity. This is a plant that people need to tend by burning in order to bring um, the camas to uh, fruit. Okay. Paying attention, <laughs> knowing names. Um, a number of educators, of course, have pointed out that we are natural taxonomists. We categorize, we learn names like crazy. And our kids, and let's face it, ourselves, we're pretty good at this, aren't we? Recognizing corporate logos. Who is it that really sustains us in the world? Where are we giving our attention? Our natural means, our natural tendency to pay attention to that which supports our life has been simply hijacked by, by advertisers. It is to me terrifying that kids can recognize 100 corporate logos and recognize fewer than 10 plants. The average American knows fewer than 10 plants, and you know what tops the list? Christmas tree and grass. So those are hardly even count. So we have a problem with plant blindness. How can we understand and relate to the world as gifts if we don't even know the gift givers, if we don't even know their names or anything about what it is that they offer us every single day? How can we be better students of plants? Pay attention. Know about their gifts, share that knowledge with those around you. And speaking of plant names, I said I'd get back to Linnaeus, right? Uh, hi, we're Chloe Odorata, that he gave the name to Sweetgrass. Um, what you see here are two great botanists and neighbors. We all know that Linnaeus is the great neighbor, and when we have took Bio 101, we were told that he was, in fact, the father of, of naming the taxonomy. Because before 1770, no one had names for plants. <laughs> um, well, on the other side, you see Nana Bush, Nana Bojo in our culture. You know, when Nana Bojo came to the earth as the first man, Anishinaabe man, he was given a job by the creator. And his job was to give names. But how would he do bestowed names in a foreign language, right, in standardized scientific nomenclature. Um, he bestowed 
Mainly. Mainly, as we know, is a powerful act of control as well as attention. But how did Nanabush do it? Nanabush didn't give me. His job was to wander the world, getting to know all the plants and animals so well that they would reveal to him their real name. And here we see again this subject, versus subject. Who has the right to give a name? If it's an object, you can call it anything you want. If it's a subject, you would presume you would wait to know and have it, the, the true name be revealed. So we have again these different lenses for looking at the beingness of nature as object and as subject. And this brings me to um, a peculiarity of language. We talked about natural resources versus gift as an interesting linguistic idea. But I'd like you to think for just a little bit about how we refer to the living world in the English language. All these beings, all these gifts. And if I was to say something about Mokot or the bear, I would have to say it's scratching the tree, right? It, I would have to refer to all of these beings as it. Because in English, we have a very peculiar grammar that we don't want to think about. But in English, you're either a human or you're an it. If your grandma was scared of one, taking soup at the stove, and someone said, oh, well, look, it's wearing an apron. That's not right. It's not only rude, but, but we just really disrespected her, right? We took her humanity and her personhood away from her. She who was about to provide for us. But in English, how do we speak of all of those if bearers of gifts in the natural world who provide for us. We only say it. Right? And even in our language, in our beautiful English language, this notion of object and the lack of person, the lack of beingness is present. And I think that we can talk about this in the consequences for our worldview and the way that we relate to the land. This imposition of the notion of it is really a tool of linguistic imperialism. It is a tool of colonization, which we feel acutely today in our relationships with the living world. And you know, in the Potawatomi language, it's impossible to say it of the living world. We can't do it. We speak of that blue jay and of that strawberry with the same grammar that we use for our family members, because they are our family. And so encoded in this little piece of grammar is a worldview is of objectified nature. And if nature is an object, if it's not made up of being with persons, then we have a certain we have a certain kind of permission, if you will, to exploit it. Because when we objectify people, when we objectify nature, we're very good at this, um, it creates a circle of moral exclusion. It says you're other. And generally speaking, where are natural beings on that hierarchy? Those others are lower than, lesser than beings. And so this um, objectification of nature, which is captured in our worldview and in our language, um, I think is emblematic of, of our relationship. And so what I'd like to do is to um, invite you into a little experiment to think about how indigenous languages the world over have this concept of animacy in the language that you cannot say it about a, a living being. It's just not possible. We speak of grammar of animacy. And could we in some way, and the English, could we step away from objectification of the living world by being very conscious about the way that we speak? And so the proposal is a modest proposal. The pronouns of the revolution um, reclaim the grammar of animacy, change, begin to change our thinking and the way that we behave in the world through grammar. And I thought for a long time, well, how in the world could you do this? So I asked one of my elders, so my language teacher, you know, is there a word in Potawatomi for a living being of the earth so that you don't not say that they're 
human. That's not anthropomorphism, but you're a being. Um, is there a word? And if there is, it's vamadati akhi. And it simply means a living being of the good earth. Actually, the good being of the living earth. Um, and so it's a, there is a word for it. There is a concept for it, which is built into our language. And when we look at that beautiful word, the modesty aki, um, in a culture where we can, where we rarely tolerate speaking a language other than English, I do think that incorporation of the modesty aki into our language is really going to work. But what about he? He, that last phoneme on the beautiful word aki, which means the earth, which sounds a bit like he and she. Could we refer to living beings not as it, in a disrespectful objectification, as if they were just a paperclip or a pencil? We use it for them, not for sacred living beings who are our teachers and our providers. Could we say of that maple tree in the spring, he is giving us sap this year? He is his branches are waving in the wind. Could we refine our language and pause for a moment to think, are these living beings or are they objects? And I went back and forth with my elders talking about this, this word, and we had some concerns about, we, um, um, about cultural appropriation. Um, associated with this, with inspiring a new grammar of intimacy. And uh, there's lots of very interesting discussions about that. So we were really grateful that English already had a word that works for the plural of key. Because in Potawatomi, to make a, line, a word plural, you add an N. We already have that already have that word so that when the geese fly back in the spring we can say kin are filling the sky welcome back so that every time we speak of the living world we speak of relationship of respectful relationship how do we reciprocate the gifts of the plants this notion of personhood is far more than a notion of the pronoun. What we're really talking about is extension of thinking about personhood to living beings, right? And this has a ramification for the political, legal worlds, as well as the ecological worlds. Because what you're looking at here is the sacred river of the Maori people. This is the Wanganui River that four years ago um, was declared only Person. Out of the Maori concepts of animacy of all beings, that river is understood and has legal personhood. So decisions about that river need to be made up for the well-being of that river. So these ideas of personhood are, are, are not kind of arcane constructs. They have real meaning in the world. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it, that in this country, um, the only Things that can be recognized as legal persons, aside from ourselves, are corporations. But the rest of the, particularly in the indigenous led world, has other ideas about that. Because as you know, in Ecuador, the constitution of Ecuador enshrines the personhood of nature, assigning rights to Pachamama, rights to uh, that Mother Nature has her own inherent right. Implementation of this is, is um, far more difficult conceptualization of it, but here we have it. And it's true in Bolivia as well. And Bolivia was the leader of a coalition to bring before the United Nations the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, which is also this notion of personhood, of subjecthood for Mother Nature, uh, for Pachamama, for Gaia, for all the different languages. And so these ideas from indigenous ways of thinking of plants and persons as teachers, as esteemed beings, is finding its way into international law. The climate, Paris Climate Talks was one of the first um, um, courts uh, for crimes against nature. Um, in addition, 
condition parallel to crimes against humanity. So if we consider plants to be persons, that has implications for how we relate to plants as consumers, does it not? If plants are persons. In the Western world, where we say that plants are not persons, or even so much in many cases beings, and certainly not legal persons, we refer to them all as is, that permission to exploit means that we don't really have to worry about the ethical consequences of them, because it's just a thing. We, and, and they are outside our circle of, of moral um, and, or ecological compassion. In indigenous ways of thinking, remember, if we're thinking about the plants as beings, as teachers, as our relatives, and we're going to eat them, this sets up certain ethical um, tensions for sure. Um, but it's, it's really important that they're aware because they're so aware as human beings, we can't go to synthesize. We have to eat plants. We can't just call them it and have no ethics associated with it. We recognize them as persons and our relatives. So we have to have very special ethics associated with honoring the life that they give us. And this is encoded in a series of practices which are understood as the honorable parts. So when we recognize the plants as gift givers, as beings, as teachers, rules come up for, for essentially consuming your beloved family. And these rules were taught to me as a berry picker, as a medicine gatherer. Um, and they may seem at first like kind of plain prescriptions for how it is that we go berry picking. But I think you'll see that they are um, Potentially very strong ways to reconceptualize and enact our relationship with the earth. When I go to pick berries, maybe this is safe for you. To say that we never take the first one. We come upon the first ones and we greet them and say thank you to them and we pass them by. This self restraint is an inherent conservation mechanism because if you don't take the first one, you're not going to take the last one. And when we come to the one that we can take, in some cultures it's the third one, in some cultures it's the seventh one, we ask permission. We actually speak to that plant, introduce ourselves, and, and ask that plant if it has enough to share. Would you allow me to bring some medicine home for my daughter, some berries home for that, for that pie? We ask permission. And I understand that if you came upon somebody in the woods who was talking to a patch of strawberries, you might think that they were um, a little over the edge. Um, but in our culture, it's just good manners. It's good manners. Would you go into your grandmother's house and start rifling through her cupboards for cookies? Yeah, you laugh. Yeah, only once. <laughs> you only do that once, um, right? Um, and in a sense, that's how we treat our beloved grandmother, the earth. We just go take whatever we want. But the honorable harvest says, no, you don't. You ask permission. You ask permission. And then your grandma will probably give you all the cookies that you want on her best china plate. And if you ask permission, you have to listen for the answer. And understanding plants as beings, as persons, there are many ways to answer that. As a scientist, I listen for that answer and look at the population density, look at the vigor of the plant. Do they have enough to share? So on and so forth. There are biologically empirical ways to listen for that answer. But there are also intuitive ways to listen for that answer. And if the answer is no, you go home. You go home with an empty basket because they don't belong to you. If, it, if, if, if you take without permission, what is that called? Right. So we take with honor. We don't take unless we have permission. Take only what you need, of course. We all know that. Much harder to practice. Minimize harm in the way that you're taking it. The lesson that was given to me is never use a shovel with a digging stick for you. Use appropriate technology. Minimize the harm that comes from your taking from the natural world. Use everything that you take because you are, you are taking a life. You are taking a life or a life being given to you as a gift from the plants. Uh, well, this applies to animals as well, and we don't disrespect that. Practice gratitude. Be grateful. Be grateful for everything that's given to you. 
And gratitude, again, may seem like sort of a hollow good manners or politeness. Um, but gratitude is really powerful because when you practice gratitude, it helps you remember that you have everything that you need already. It makes you feel abundant. And gratitude, practicing gratitude brings you into relationship with, with all that is, with those, those beings. Um, you can't feel um, separated when you're grateful. And you know what? I recently read some really interesting studies about consumption. And we know that it is consumption that has us hanging on the brink of climate chaos. It is consumption that has led us into the sixth extinction. And you know one of the correlates to the strength of consumption is gratitude. People who practice gratitude consume less. So this ethic has real concrete repercussions. Share everything that you've taken. The plants have shared with you. And so we then have to share what we've taken. We take those strawberries and give them to somebody else, as well as, as, as to your families. And always reciprocate the gift. In return for those berries, for that root, you need to give something back. And there's a lot of teachings about what that something could be. It could be, in the case of berries, you're going to weed around them and reduce the competition. It could be you're going to pick the bugs off. It could be you're going to take the seeds and carry them to a new place. These really practical things that your gift of attention and respect pay off for that plant so that you flourish and the plant flourishes as well. Oftentimes, the gifts are also um, spiritual in nature giving you prayer, giving you words, giving you song, giving you my culture of tobacco, sacred soul, and back to that plant. Um, so, reciprocating the gift is a very important law. And I'm almost out of time. So I think what I want to do is to close with this notion of reciprocity and the gift. In our culture, we are told that gifts and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. So that um, when we think about a bird singing in the morning, we say, well, that bird was given this beautiful gift of song. And then the whole world receives it as a gift. It's so beautiful. It just looks so good in the morning. But in return for that gift that the bird was given, it has a responsibility to sing up to the sun. So the gift comes with a responsibility, right? And that's what we mean. The stars were given this gift of, of twinkling and the responsibility to show us our, our direction and, and light. Everything comes in this duality of gift and responsibility. And when we think about the difficulties that face us in this particular time, we could ask ourselves, heavy heart, you know, what's my responsibility? And sometimes that's harder to answer. But what if you ask yourself, what is my gift? What is my gift? And when that becomes giving your gift, it becomes your responsibility. And is your gift as a teacher, as a scientist, as an artist, as a writer, as a photographer? And the notion of this coupling of gifts and responsibility is that in return for the gift that we are given by the earth, that each of us is called upon to give our gift in return. So that collectively, we might do what our clan mother, Audrey Shenandoah, uh, beseeched us to do, and that is to seek justice, not only for ourselves, but justice for all creation. Miigwech, Miigwech, thank you very much. Sure. You bet. You bet. Any questions? Yeah.
Any questions or comments? Thank you, Robin. It's a beautiful talk, John Grimm. I recall in an article by Winona LeDuc that she opened it by talking about Bima de Zewin, Bima de uh -huh. and she uh, translated it or gave it as a uh, long life, happiness, living into old age. And I caught uh, among the, your names of the plant, uh, Bima de Zate. So I was looking yeah. for the relationship between the uh, uh, Ojibwe yeah. uh, rendition of, uh, of a, a value in life, a primary central value in life, and here this value is then embedded in plants. Yeah, um, and uh, to clarify, Ojibwe and Potawatomi are very close languages, a member of the same language family, and the notion of the mod is win um, means a, a, a good and full life um, it has many nuances of what does it mean to have a good, full life. But being, it literally means to walk in a good way on the earth. Uh, and uh, so the, the notion of the modesty that I've used here is one who is living that the modesty with on the earth. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's, I can feel very moved. I can feel very close to so many of the concepts that you are ta talking about today. I feel that my culture is so far away from me. So I'm wondering, how do we take the steps, little or small, to begin to turn that around as individuals in this society? Amy, I, Sorry. No, Amy, I honor your emotion about that because it is a grief. It is a grief to know that we have this world of these beings who are famous and the way we treat those who take care of us in such a, well, such a way. It is a source of grief. I think about you and making the wonderful work on understanding our, our grief using the measure of our love. Um, and that to me, um, as we try to heal this great rift of objectification of the living world, um, I think the notion of paying attention is really, really important. And not relegating paying attention to living beings to nature over there, that we have to go to the um, rainforest in Ecuador to know nature. So we have to go to the Adirondacks to know nature. Um, that's um, that our regard for living beings are in our garden and in the craft of our, our cycle. Pay attention, pay attention. Um, and I think that all of these things that transform the way that we are are our human gifts. We don't have to invent this because we're really good at gratitude. We're really good at gift giving. And, and when we turn those to the living beings around us, then we really have something. Um, we don't have to invent something new. We have to extend our patience, the compassion that we feel sometimes for some humans <laughs> to the living world. But then maybe as a follow-up, I can see us individually committing to that and doing that. Um, or do you have any insights as to how we create greater change in our entire society and the consumerism that we do embody, that we see all around us, um, our governance and things like that? How do we do you have thoughts on how that can become big enough so that there is systemic change? Um, of course, like probably every one of us in this room is wrestle with exactly that question. How do we scale this to world new change? Because that is what we do. We have to scale it. And one of the things that I have found important to talk about, and the reason that I um, a great deal of time and effort both writing and teaching and speaking about indigenous knowledge systems is because I think we have somehow got trapped in the notion that the relationship, the damaged relationship that you're talking about, the one that brings us grief to our estrangement from the living world, we tend to think that that's our default, that that's just the way 
it is, just the way it is for, for humanity. But what we have forgotten is that it's really just an odd length of time that we have been in this objectified worldview. For most of human history, we have lived with notions of gratitude and reciprocity. We live well and rich. Um, it is if we have been doing experiments since the Industrial Revolution, what would it be like if we treated the world as if it was it? And it was you. Instead of he, instead of him. We've been doing an experiment today. What if we treated the world as if it was dead? And the experiments are the, the data from the results of those experiments are in, right? And we don't like them. And so I think it's really important to be. To know that and to speak about that, that that is that there are other ways to be that are coherent, um, long products of cultural evolution um, in place. And, and there are so many tools. I mean, when we talk about being there, being on the land, paying attention, um, conversations, stories, science, all the gifts that everyone in this room possess, if deployed toward this notion. I think can be very fun. Be very fun. Not going to happen from the top. Hi. Thanks. Um, I'm Elena. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, I was very intrigued by your thoughts on language and culture, sort of what you alluded to just now. And um, I'm from Greece. So in Greek language, we do have gender for everything. We don't say it pretty much for anything, except, except for a few neutral things. But I regret to say that doesn't make us any more um, nicer to the earth or yes. thoughtful or anything. Yes. Um, what do you think it's going to take other than changing the language in terms of you know getting people to actually see that? And what are the other tools that we can use? Because I feel like language might be one small part of it, but it will take a lot more. Absolutely, absolutely. People have brought me so many examples. The way we have animacy in our language, and you know, we're not doing so well. So it, it, it certainly is um, and, and we're not talking about deterministic here. It, it's often uh, correlated, but it's certainly not deterministic. One of my students actually had an interesting insight about this notion of the changed pronoun. Uh, she said, Do you remember? Um, that we used to say when the fire truck would go by, we would say, well, they're, they're the firemen are going to you know, put out the fire. But do we say that anymore? We say firefighters, don't we? A cultural shift has occurred, a little cultural shift in language. And we pause. And we say firefighter because in that pause, we're saying both men and women can, be, can put out reasons. And in just in that pause of, of choosing to use a different word, it reflects change and it propels change. And so this notion of not pausing before saying it about living being could have that same effect. But it's about so much more than language. It means what we really need is a change of heart. Um, and this is what, for me as a, as, as a scientist, I feel like I'm. I don't think we need more data. I don't think we need more information. Um, I, think, I don't think we need to change technology. We need to change our heart. But truthfully, I think that we already have um, that we have that unique sense of wonder and love and beauty for the natural world, but we have to let it out. We have to free it. And there's all these things around us that push us down the path. But we have to choose. Maybe a partial hopeful answer about how we can. I'm sorry. Maybe a partial hopeful answer about how we can start to move the society a little bit. Um, I thought I was the only one. I thought, in fact, that my recent and incredibly increased attention toward plants. I used to, when my parents were alive, be polite about their gardens, but I wasn't paying attention. After they died, I got so mind boggling amazed at what plants do that, you know, I thought I was being haunted. <laughs> anyway, then I realized, 
because I ran around a bit, this is a common pattern that people as they age frequently do get this way. And I remembered that the Voltaire Candide at the end of that whole story, what Candide and I'm going to do is tend their garden to do old age. So if, you know, I mean, we have an avalanche of aging people here. I think it's time to start to push, pay attention to plants as a really fine thing that can help with society. And the sense of gratitude, as I understand it, is a huge key to happy aging. The time in the garden is, is, a, is a perfect place to understand plants as beings and plants as gifts and our relationship to them. Your, the, both the way that you phrased your question and the question itself um, makes me think of, you know, when we do pull together this question that none of us have the answer to of how do we change our world. Um, but again, I want to come back to this notion of what we already know that we don't have to invent. And, you know, I've, I've come to see my work both as a scientist, as a writer, as a teacher, and as a parent and grandparent, as a human being, is to help people again come to fall in love with them. And when we fall in love with them, we call out for them. Uh, hello. Thank you. Um, I am struck that the uh, the way I heard your description of the honorable harvest works really well for very low impact gathering and maybe hunting. But anytime we're doing something else, any kind, even the most ecologically sensitive polyculture farming, or um, something like selective, selectively burning certain areas to promote the, the the growth of particular species there, that's us saying we're we're choosing what gets to what lives there, right? When we when we move around and we live places, we we have these bubbles of control of ecologies around us. And um, that, in, in that, any of those, in, in these kinds of many different, many different ways, that's so selectively saying, we're going to destroy what's here mm -hmm. and, and put something else there or allow something else to grow there. And um, unless you invoke metaphysics, which I'm not the first to do, I am a religious person, um, the rest of the world would be at least as better off, if not much better off, uh, if you know, if, without our without our participation. And so, my I, I am I am coming to a place of uh, nihilism that the um, this kind of uh, reciprocal relationship is something that is ever attainable at anywhere. I hear your question, and there's just so much more wrapped up in it. Um, the only tiny little story, slug, that I didn't get to is we asked ourselves exactly that question How can we take in such a way that promotes life, promotes regeneration, in a sense, under the um, agency of the plant? Can we have true neutralism? Um, and let me just tell you this tiny little story. It is about sweetgrass. We did some experimental work with sweetgrass, which is harvested by basket makers and, and people. And um, I'm trying to think of how to abbreviate this story. In the, way, it, the, the plant was, was declining. Um, and so one of the questions that the basket makers came to us at the center asking for some help and understanding this. And um, because the plant was declining, what does Western conservation biology tell us we must do when that plant is um, becoming a nature? We have to leave it alone, right? Because nature and people are a bad mix. So stay away from that. We just stop harvesting the sweetgrass so that it can become. The basket makers, the indigenous basket makers, told us something a little bit different. 
a lot of this, a lot of information. But one of the things that we learned from them is we evaluated the response of sweetgrass to harvesting. And so we had a plot where we didn't take any, and we know what would happen there, right? The sweetgrass flourished because we were blessing with it. And then we had other plots where we harvested the sweetgrass according to the honorable harvest. We went measured your, your dollar plenty quality tool to measure a success. And do you know what happened? The plant, the plots of plants that had no human intervention, that had no harvester there saying to them, taking their, receiving their gift and reciprocating, the control plots that Western science said should drive decline. The plots that were harvested according to the owner of the harvest doubled in their vigor. What we saw was that practice of the honorable harvest with sweet grass was a stimulus of the plant in taking and accepting the gift and reciprocating the care of the plant that it regenerates. So there are models out there of true mutual, true reciprocity um, among these. Um, and I don't want to oversimplify this in any way. Um, there are plenty of plants that wouldn't respond in that same way. Um, but but I hold that up as an example of the shift our our frames to say, well, what are the ways in which humans and plants could be mutually beneficial to one another? We find them. And working with with native communities um, really around the world, listening to them talk about this concept, there are so many examples of the plants that flourish when people harvest them. So much if you need to. Long answer, but a good question. Yeah. Are you heartened at all? There's Phil, thank you. It was a wonderful talk. <clears throat> Are you heartened at all by trends like the local war food movement in community gardens, especially in poor underserved communities? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, to me, that is one of the most important and I should say heartening examples. When the, when the local food movement um, began, I was a little skeptical about it. It seems like it was coming from a place of great privilege and, and so forth. But what I'm seeing in the local food movement is that it is reawakening our relationship to land, to soil, to water. And it's it's cutting across all borders, um, from urban gardens to um, the indigenous food sovereignty movements um, uh, to anti-Monsanto kind of um, political movements. So yeah, I think the food movement is, is a huge indicator and maybe a, even a, a tool of what you're shaping our relationship to everybody eats. music time, huh? Okay, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. I found that this a really powerful way to look at things a little differently. And I liked, um, I really liked that she's a scientist and she pulls these things together and that these two perspectives coexist and make both sides deeper. Um, I want to make sure that we don't just do that thing where you watch a video and then you walk away and check out. But I also know people don't love staring in a giant group <laughs> uh, with me standing at the front. So what I'd like you to do is take a minute and reflect on what we just watched, what we talk about, or what she talked about, and talk with your tables about whether there's anything that brings up for you, brings to your mind. You can share stories. You can. Uh, talk about concepts you have trouble with or things you really like or how this is the same or different than things you've done here in college. And I'm going to just, just go around and pop into discussions uh, instead of telling you all my stories. <laughs> I always like talking, but um, I want to give you guys a minute to process. Thank you.